because of today being the last morning session oh thank you that I'm going to preach a message that will not only bless us that are here those who are going to listen to this message either on YouTube internet or those who are going to buy the CD DVD audio CD in the future I pray Lord that let my tongue be the tongue of a ready writer. Lord, let me not say what I want to say. Let me speak or say what you want me to say. Lord, give a deeper insight to your word. Move me by the Spirit to speak words. Give me supernatural knowledge and direct my speech I receive grace today in the name of Jesus let your people be blessed let your people be inspired and let your people be revived thank you father in Jesus name we have prayed amen and amen please you can be seated I'll be preaching on the topic rumble in the temple the rumble in the temple rumble is r-o-u-m-b-l-e the rumble in the temple i grew out by the grace of god being born again And in the midst of being born again, I was introduced to the SU. And I was with the SU for quite some years. Really some years. Before I eventually... Then, there were no more churches around. No Pentecostal church around. And what we do is to just hold fellowship in primary school and all that. Then on Sunday, just go to any church. But those times, we had a very strong foundation. Those times, we were taught the word of God. We don't go to church because we need prosperity, or because we need healing, or because we want blessings. We serve God and we go to church willfully, with all our heart, with all our mind. Those times, we don't even copy the things that are of the world. They gave us names. SU, holy, holy people, and all that. Obviously, then I did not even know whether there was any ministry called Deeper Life. Though later I now heard that there was a church called Deeper Life that is existing, holding Bible studies, not Sunday services. And we held to this word and we got some of our foundation, teaching, principle, ethics from the, that early time when we were in those places. Now, if you look throughout till this present time, something has gone wrong. The church has actually expanded, but there are many things that are out of place. 
You see today, people go to church because they want something from God. And if you don't tell them they will receive something, they don't bother coming. If you want to, if there's a project, and you say, give towards this project, people will not give. But if you tell them, give, and you shall get, then they will give. Something is wrong somewhere. The lifestyle and the standard of Christianity has actually fallen. They were more so one to the Lord, good. But many people don't follow the example that has been laid down in the Bible. And the Bible makes us to understand, even Paul said, follow me for I follow Christ. Be an example of believer in words, in conduct. And the problem is there in everywhere. Today, I mean, things has really gone so low that even in the church, people come to the church to steal. They come to the church to steal handset, steal phone. They look for girlfriend in the church. And when you park car, they are ready to steal the car outside. But some of you that have been in the Lord, you know this. That in those days, the people reverence the church. But today, you see the ushers. You have to put a lot of security. Ushers and those working in the accounts and deacons and deaconesses. And those working along the finance of the church. They take the money from the offering and use it for their own purpose. What has gone wrong? No more conscience. I'm going to break today's teaching into three subheadings. One, controversy in the temple. Two, conscious or consciousness of the spirit. Three, conquering nation of the spirit. Now, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, 1 Timothy 3, 15, Paul said this, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how that thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. Now take note of this word. The house of God. The church of God. These words are important. The house of God is the church. Of the living God. The pillar and the ground of the truth. So truth ought to be seen in the house of God. Truth. Truth. This morning when we were doing our quiet time, in where we have been for some days now, we were reading some place in the Bible, and Paul was writing to Timothy. Now, for your information, Timothy was like a bishop. Then he was writing him, he said, Timothy, do the work of an evangelist and make full proof of what? The ministry. It is very possible that someone could be a bishop, an apostle, a prophet, but the job he is giving to is an evangelist. And this what happened to Timothy and said, Timothy, 
Not minding the fact that you are of this position as a bishop. Not minding the fact that you are in this position. Do the work of an evangelist. I was telling somebody recently. I say a lot of people disvalue the work of an evangelist. And listen to me for your information. I'm a pastor. I'm an evangelist. I'm a pastor. An evangelist, if you look at the hierarchy of how Paul stated the position of evangelist, evangelist is higher than a pastor. And when Paul was writing, he listed it. First of all, he said the apostle. Second, he said what? The prophet. The third was what? Evangelist. Is it not there in your Bible? Then the fourth is what? Pastor. Then the last one is what? Teachers. But you see, a lot of people, they don't do the work of an evangelist. We stay as a pastor. We stay as a brother. We stay as a church member. And forget to know that the work of evangelism or as an evangelist is powerful. It's real. And that is reaching out to the world. The world is your pupit. You, it's not just the local assembly. Pastor take care of the local assembly. And evangelists take care of the world. The streets. The town. The city. In Galatians chapter 5 verse 16. Galatians chapter 5 verse 16. This I say then. If you look at this scripture. Paul. I like the writing of Paul. When he opens his mouth, his English, his explanation, the way he exposed the scripture marvels me. He gave himself to knowledge. He never allowed his philosophical knowledge to affect his, the word of God in his, heart, in his heart. Look at it again. Ephesians 5 verse 16. This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusted against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one to another, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Now, now, now take note of the, that word. Contrary to one another. This is the rumble we are talking about. The one rumble is fighting. Is contradicting each other. Rivaling groups. Rivaling, trying to take control. There could be a rumble in the marriage where a man is involved with two wives. The two women are rumbling on who to, to take control of the man. There is it. Then I go to point number one. Controversy in the temple. Now, when you look through the scripture, when Paul was writing to the Felician, he said this, Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concessions. He spelled out, spelled it out. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Don't let your friend choose you. You should choose your friend. One of my pastors is here. He's not pastoring in, in Kadna State. He's pastoring somewhere else. He's here right now. He told me something. A very close friend of mine who I recommended to him. I said, this man was in Kadna before the Sharia crisis. I knew him then. The year 2000, he left Kadna. He is now in your place. You can get his phone number and always talk with him. So I said, okay, you can invite him, let him preach in your church. So he kept coming to preach. And when he comes to preach, he will give phone numbers. He will be calling phone numbers. Your phone number is 080. Where is the person come out? He will give such, so direct prophetic word. 
he was doing it he was preaching in that branch of our church so my pastor now told me one day he said that your friend you knew before the year 2000 called him and said do you want your church to grow he said yes okay i'll take you to a place say take you to a say don't you want to see don't you want to be calling phone numbers of people don't you want to be calling the names and giving details of their village and giving them revelations and visions if you get that your church will grow so he said, he now asked, my pastor now asked him, he said, where is the place? He now called one interior village. He said, what are they going to do? Is it mountain where they pray? He said, no, you just do this thing. You just do some few things, some rituals. And they will put it in on your body. And they will see, and you will start seeing. When he told me, I was shocked. I said, please, from today, don't allow him to preach in your altar again. That is rumbling in the temple. Say, so don't allow him to preach in your temple. Now, what we see today is controversies, fighting. Who to who, who should take control? When we talk about the temple, what are we talking about? We are talking about the body of Christ. Jesus used this language and said, Kill this body, kill it, destroy it, this temple, and I will build it up in three days. You know, that's a temple. And obviously, you know that when we associate ourselves with evil workers, we partake with them. You are already part of it. The Bible says, don't even give them God's speed or well done. It says, wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate. There are evil workers around. There are people that want to lead us astray with advice, with counseling. They want to introduce things you have never seen before. We should come away from them. We shouldn't temper with those things. The battle of the mind is so real. We're not talking about the battle of the mind. We're talking about what is going on in the inside of you. Inside of your mind. The battle of the mind is much more than the battle of wars outside. Let me give you one reference. In Romans chapter 7. Talk with me to Romans chapter 7 verse 15. Romans chapter 7, verse 15. Paul finds himself in a very serious battle. Serious battle. There was rumbling in his mind. In his temple. Because this body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. This temple, this body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. There was rumbling in Paul's body. Temple. And it was serious. Verse 15 says, for, verse 15, Romans 7, 15, for that which I do, I allow not. For what I would that I do, what I would that I not, but what I hate that I do. Verse 18 says, verse 18, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelling no good things for to will to pray his presence with me but how to perform that which is good i find not for the good that i would i do not but the evil which i would not that i do i found then a law that when i would do good evil is present with me for i delight in the law of god after the in one man, but I see another law in my member, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is 
in my members. Now, hear this. Let me explain it in my words. Paul said, I want to do good. And each time I want to do good, evil is present. Each time I want to practice something that is good, something will interfere with it. He said, the good I want to do, I don't do that. I, I, I find it got to do, do the good thing I want to do. I find myself doing the, the bad thing. Is it not happening to some of us? We don't want to do some things, but we we'll find ourselves doing. It is those things you said you will not do. You find yourself doing. You made promises. You made vow. Hey, no, I wouldn't do this thing again. The more you promise you won't do it, the, I mean, the more you discover you are doing it. He said he's a wretched man. So what is controlling him? What's wrong with me? This law is fighting. Something is going on. There's wrongly in me. I want to please God. But I discovered pleasing myself. Ladies and gentlemen, this rumble, today, it will come to an end. That dominating power, fighting our flesh, it shall be destroyed in Jesus' name. Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days I will build it up. That evil that is controlling us, God will give us victory over it in Jesus' name. Can you shout a better amen? amen? Point number two. Conscious and conscience and consciousness of the spirit. When we talk about conscience, we are talking about the human part that hears the voice of God. Human conscience is God's voice in man. And listen to me. Conscience cannot lie. Just as you cannot lie to yourself. Can you lie to yourself? There's no way you will lie. You can't lie to yourself. Conscience won't lie to himself. You can lie to others. You can't lie to yourself. You can't deceive yourself. Because the truth lies inside your conscience. The truth. If you are doing the right thing, it's in your conscience. In a way, conscience is the sense of right and wrong. Conscience is the sense of right and wrong doing. Ladies and gentlemen, now look at yourself. When you do right, you know it. When you do wrong, you know it. And what we do is start to suppress your conscience when we do wrong and justify our conscience with things that will please us. And each time we, we are trying to oppress, the rumbling is taking place, oppressing our conscience to practice what is evil. The more we oppress it, the more it comes out once in a while again and comes out again. This thing is wrong. You try to justify yourself. After a while, this thing is wrong. Try to justify yourself. This thing is wrong. If you keep doing it over and over, the Bible says, your conscience will be seared with a hot iron. That means your conscience is dead. When initially, some of you ladies, initially when you, when you are exposed to certain things, when you want to go out, Maybe the way you make up yourself, the way, the kind of things you wear, you go say, this is not good. Ah, it's not good. I can't, I can't wear this one. You go and change it. Your friend tells you, oh, it's good. It's good. Go ahead. Maybe once in a while you just put it up and throw around and come back. You don't go far with it. And after some time again, you just try to, I mean, then when you want to go to church, you say, ah, this, I can't wear this clothes to church. I want to go to this clothes to church. And because something tells you that this thing is not good. You can't wear it to church. You can't do it, do it. And you just disobey your conscience. See, that is it. Your conscience is a sense of right or wrong. But what about consciousness? Consciousness is a state of awareness. It's a state of knowingness. It's a state where you are aware or conscious. Or, or know that you are existing.
existing. You are a man. You are a human being. You have the potential of doing what every other human being do. Consci consciousness. It is your consciousness that makes you to be active and please your, or do things that please your environment or people around you. Now in Matthew chapter 18, verse 4, the Bible says, by Matthew chapter 18, verse 4, Whosoever therefore shall humble himself, oh my God, I like this. I like this. You want to be great? You want to be number one in town? Greatness is good. It's good to be a great man. It's good to be a great woman. I read it again. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. To be great does not mean how to do great things. How to be mighty things. How to be these in order for me to be a great man or great woman in the society, in the street, in my family, as a businessman, as a trader. No. The little thing you do, if God breathes on it, it can make you great. But then, he said this, Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child. That means you should, if you are able to bring yourself down, as a child if you can be able to be lonely as a child if you can be able to forsake all and follow Christ as a child you say pastor but what about my past life I'm not here to talk about your past life forget about your past life your past life is all gone God has forgiven you even if you are the worst sinner anywhere even if you are the worst sinner anywhere, it's gone. You are not born again. You are not washed by the blood of Jesus. You are not a preacher. Oh, you are not that. But the issue is that if you want to be on top, you must come down. In business, you must come down. Because the way up is down. Humility. The Bible says, if you exalt yourself, you will be what? You will be abased. But if you bring yourself down, what happened? You will be lifted up. The reason why many of us have not reached certain level is because we have not come down. We have not come down. Many years ago, I was with somebody. And um, then that was before I came to Sunday, uh, one Sunday here or Sabo here. And I, I was to preach and the man of God just came into the uh, uh, church. Great man of God. I have been in ministry for quite some years. And I just continued my preaching and I finished preaching, went to the office and sat me down and said, Pastor, oh, you're wonderful. He said, but this message you preach, if I was the one preaching it, Kai. This is where I will have gone. This is where I will have gone. This is where I will have gone. That if this word is a powerful t topic, you will have digressed it and diverted it. And before you know, people will be something else. I, I said, okay, maybe you have to pray for me so that I can be better some other time. I told him, pray for me so that you can be better some other time. And that was what I told him. Because he felt he was better. And after some day we were sitting together, he was talking. And he, I mean, in a, on that 20 minutes, he has spoken some big, big things. And I, would, I looked like a small boy in his sight. Because some of those things he was saying, I was just listening. He wouldn't allow me to talk. In fact, it's like he knows everything more than me. I was just listening. I was enjoying him. He never knew I was looking at him. I said, this man will not go anywhere. Do you know what happened? As I'm telling you now, he has closed ministry. He started close. When they get started somewhere close, the third ministry he opened somewhere. He has to close. Now he's no longer in ministry. He's somewhere else doing job. Doing job. Doing job. Not no more ministry. Why? Because he has not been able to learn how to come down. Humility is very powerful. 
the, then the, the, some years ago even when we were here there's somebody who followed me he has been following me for over the years even after Sharia, when we moved to here he was still following over the years and where i'm preaching on this altar he will sit right at the other side one day i wasn't talking to him one day he, he met me he said pastor do you know why he's a minister I mean, minister before I become, just that he wasn't having his own church, you know, just going outreach and he was just finding somewhere to just be part of wise. He said, do you know why I don't like listening to you when preaching? He said, no. He said, what you are saying is not to his standard. That's why he's always sitting out there each time, message time. He said, when it's time of prophetic when I want to demonstrate prophetic or healing, he, is going to, he comes in. But when you are teaching, preaching, say not up to standard. And this is somebody I help to assist pay house rent. Not that he's a pastor with me, but because he, he attached himself to us. And I, pay, I give him what he to teach to. Pay his house rent, take care of him and all that. And he, he, he was going here and there. But if I tell you the end result of him, he's so miserable. He cannot stand face to face with me today. Not in any way. He's so miserable. The last time I saw him, I said, Oh God. Pale over. As if he was going to die. Because of his condition was so miserable. I felt bad for him. Now, it pays to humble yourself it pays to come down because god is looking at you now if you will be qualified for the up in fact jesus said if they, if you go to a party don't just go and sit at the high seat it is better for you to be invited from the low seat and brought to the high seat than they saying oh no sorry this seat is not meant for you can you go back he said become a shame that was what jesus was talking about I mean, being lonely, be, being quiet. But today, even small boys, I'm not talking about people who are pastors. I mean, small boys you brought up as a father, as a father, and as a mother, comes out and tells his father, Father, we know more than you now. After. We are more than you now. This is our, this is our jet age. Your own age has passed. Your own father who gave birth to you. Your own father. That's rudeness. That is rudeness. You dare not look at your father or your mentor or, or, your, or your boss or someone who is ahead of you and speak those words of rudeness. No, it, it, it shouldn't be at all. This contract, this fighting, this trouble should end so that we can reach our goal in life. May you reach there in Jesus' name. In Galatians chapter 5 verse 13. Galatians chapter 5 verse 13. Say, for brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not your liberty for an occasion to the flesh. But by love, serve one another. Serve one another. Listen to me. Service is one of the most powerful things. That can take a man up. Service. Service. If you serve correctly, you read the reward. But if you serve, I was talking with some of my staff today, this morning. I was making reference to somebody somewhere, not, not here, no, no, not here. He is walking somewhere, and I said, if that person who is doing this job for that ministry. I mean, he's not a member of that church, but it's like he was being hired to do something in the church. I said, if that person that is working in that place, he receives maybe about 9,000. I said, it's better he do his job freely for that ministry, even though it's not his church, so that God will bless him than receiving that salary. They were looking at me. I said, yes. Because when you serve, and don't receive that money. God will pay you. But you if you receive that salary, 
you have received your reward already. And your salary is limited with what, to what you are receiving. If they don't pay you and you let you wait for God to pay you, when God will pay you, every eye will see it. Every eye will see it. Service is doing something for someone without expecting thank you. Service is doing something for someone without expecting a reward. Without expecting a praise or a commendation. Without expecting, I mean, like you see some people say, let's clap for this, let's clap, let's, let's appreciate for this. I don't like using those lang language. Say appreciate, let's clap for the choir. Let's clap for this. It's all good, nothing wrong with it. I don't like using it. Why? Because I felt that they are not working for me. They are working for God. God should be the one to say, well done, not me. If I do it, I'm, I do not sin anyway. But I prefer God to tell them well done. And that is the bottom line. You need to see what happened to me sometime when they introduced me to the stage. If you watch sometime, I don't wait for introduction, just walk down. Have you ever noticed that sometime? I like introduction. But sometimes introduction makes me to feel like falling between the seat and to that place. So I, 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 I prefer just going down boldly than somebody will say, welcome and give me all kind of description. And I will be feeling like, I mean, shaking. I will be shaking literally before I reach here. Or maybe I walk in, I know you give me respect. I'm not against you doing it. But if I tell you what goes in when you stand up, you will pity me. You will pity me. One day I will tell you, two of us will come down and we are coming and you see people stand up. You see what will happen to you. Even you yourself, if you are not a preacher, you yourself, you will feel you will be shaking. I mean, I'm telling you the truth. Man of God, has it happened to you? I'm telling you the truth. But they are not, they are not doing it to me. If they are doing it to me, I will stop them. But they are doing it to God. Give you honor to whom is supposed to be giving you honor. But do you know what happened? I can take all those stuff wrong. When I can miss it. If, for example, I'm coming out and I say, Oh, it's me, they are Haley. It's me, yeah, it's me. I'm a, I'm a language man of God. Look at the way all people stood up for me. Then I will die before my time. Are you hear what I'm saying? Now that is the bottom line. That is the bottom line. So humility is a key to greatness. If you truly want to. Now I was telling somebody recently, one of my staff. I, I like talking with my staff. You won't believe me. I sleep in the same bed with some of my staff. If I travel anywhere and you say, you want to give me a hotel? I say, no, come on, don't give us a hotel. All of us will sleep in this. Three of us can just sleep with my driver, with my PA, all of us sleep in the same bed. Uh, what concerns me? They bring food, all of us will eat from the same source. I'm such, I'm such. I, you know, I, I do that, I don't have, most of my pastors here, I've slept with them in the same bed. Some of them, I've, I've taken some of them to my own bedroom, my own matrimonial bedroom. Have you never entered, have you not slept on my bed? My own matrimony, I said, come on, let's stay there. Mommy is not around. Not, let's stay together. But there's no big deal about it. No big deal about it. For the fact that the general of us here, the president of Covenant High Ministry, the GO, whatever title you want to give me, the proprietor, the this, the that, the that does not change me. I am see who I am. Hallelujah. If you want to be great, Put that thing down. Now, I was telling them, I said, look. I was telling them, make a story. Look at someone. Some people have, I was telling them, I said, some people have gone to the mountain, spent 40 days prayer and fasting, maybe dry fasting, 30 days dry fasting. When they come down from the mountain, things even get worse. Have you heard that before? This gets worse. 
you want that this man has just spent 30 days of prayer and fasting things get worse the more he prays and prays and prays and prays and many men of god here should bear me witness sometimes you want to go for a program and say hey this program is going to be wonderful it's going to be wonderful and some days to the program he said i declare seven days dry fasting you will even go to that program with fasting while you are preaching you'll be drinking water the spirit of god is here and you know you are struggling <laughs> by the end of the day nothing serious happened you even discover you even experience worse things. I mean, are you, you were not at your best. Even the fact that you prayed, you are from the mountain, you hold a program, it's your own personal program, or you are invited or whatever, and things are not happening. But the day you did not even do all those preparations, something will happen, grace at work. You begin to, what happened? The thing is that it is done by works. It is done by power. It is all by grace, by the spirit of a living God. If you do anything by yourself, God will leave you alone. If you leave it to God, he will help you. Hallelujah. So I was telling them, I said, look, the reason is because you can't spend 40 days and 40 nights in fasting and prayer and don't do the right thing. If you boast that you did this and Man of God, I'm just from the mountain on 21 days. Ah, his devil must suffer. You will come back to disgrace. Because it won't be by that. If you are not humble, if you are not humble by the, I mean, down to edge humility. This is, please, please listen to me. Many miracles I've seen in my life were not because of mighty things I did. Obviously, many of you know that the issue of miracles, God has really actually poured his grace upon me on miracles, healing. I knew that when I was a student. God told me, when I told my pastor, one Reverend Joseph, who was my, the pastor of a particular church in the city where I attended secondary school, he said, yes, you just gave your life to Christ not too long, I said, not up to a year now. I, you better wait. Let me teach you on the gift of the spirit before you say this. I said, but God told me that he's going to give me the gift of healing and miracles. And I told him, like, please, then it, nothing has happened. I don't have the gift. I don't have the gift, but I told him this is what God told me. Do you know, within a year after that, the thing hit on me. Bam. And it was so clear that he saw the manifestation of the gift of the spirit. The issue here is this. It's not by work. It's not by our boasting. It's not by our technical. It's not by our method. But relying on the spirit. Relying on the grace. Relying on, on, on the, let, let it be in the winds of the spirit. And flow with the winds. Then you'll get there. Obviously, you must live a holy life. Holiness is the most holiness on the Lord. You must be in peace with people and you must be a lover of people. You must love people. You will be in peace with people and serve, I mean, with all your heart. I mean, service. Serving with all your heart, with all your mind, with your skill. Be in peace with people and be in peace with God. And also, the subject of giving is so important. Please, listen to me. Let me clarify something about giving. Giving did not start from the New Testament. It started way long, before the, thousands of years before the New Testament came around. The issue of giving. And you cannot argue that. God commanded that they should collect offering unto him. It was a command that they should collect offering. In fact, when God started it, in the Bible, he even made it such a way that he said when you pay your tithe, the tithe should go straight to the Levi, the priest. It shouldn't go to the church. 
So as they collect it, they should go, it should go to the people, to the Levites, the priests, priest family. And it is for he said, nobody should even eat it apart from this priest. Am I, I mean, am I communicating? That is it. It's as, as rugged as that. And the whole Israel, everywhere they are, how many tribes they are, they gather their tithe and go and give it to one family. One family. Now, I'm sure that man must be very rich. What will he going to do with the whole tithe of Israel? And only him and his children. That is, that, including yam and, I mean, all kind of fruit, money, cash, everything were given to them. And they were told never to do anything at all. Not to go to farm, not to do any work, just to get it to them and let them begin to feed on that and do the work of God. Even today, today, even though in most cases because of a lot of projects, it's not what is being practiced anyway. But the issue is this. The giving stuff is this. It is compulsory for the believer who really wants to prove his loyalty to God, who wants to prove his obedience to God, who actually wants to, want to prove to God that everything in him belongs to him, to give of his resources to God as many times as is possible. As possible. The Bible says, give in the morning, give in the evening. So in the morning, so in the evening. That's the Bible. I'm not preaching something else. That means you keep doing it. The Bible says, scatter it. You see, if we believe it, why don't we practice it? If we see it in the scripture, why don't we practice it? We find it go to give our tithe. We find it go to give. When we give, we complain. Hey, they gave yesterday. Why are they giving today? Hey, it's money, 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 money. And we are help you to go further in life. It is the key to success. And yes, and if you believe it, you get it. We put you into such condition so that you can have the breakthrough in life. So that God will see you and honor you. Hallelujah. The last point. Conquering the nation or conquering nation of the spirit. In Ephesians chapter 5 verse 17. Ephesians 5 17 to 18. Wherefore, be ye not unwise. Oh my God. Wherefore, be not as foolish men or foolish women. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Verse 18. And be not drunk with wine wherein in excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with what? Be filled with what? There's nothing as powerful as that. Being filled with the Spirit. Being filled in the Spirit. Spirit. There's something I have always said over and over. If there was anything I needed in life, if there was anything I needed in life, was the anointing. And I used to say that over and over. You see, I don't, I don't need money. I need the anointing. People, you may pray for money. You may ask God to give you money. I'm not saying it's not wrong I, I, to pray about money. But listen to me. The anointing is a key thing. If you are anointed, you get money. Whether you are a carpenter, of course you will know in the Bible where the sons of Israel were given with, they are given the anointing to do carpentry work. You know that before? Yeah. There were other people that were anointed to do to deal with matters of gold 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 thing fabricating gold and for the temple of the they were anointed they had the spirit and they were classical in those things so it is the anointing that matters if there's anything you need for a success in life and ministry please it's not money many of us say money if i get it i will succeed it is not money it is the anointing if I were you, I would never preach another sermon until I get the anointing. I will never. Ha! You know, many years, many years ago, uh, I started the first church I started. I started that first, first church, I think, in 1983. And a pastor called me and said, uh, Royness, you see, we see the way the grace of God is upon your life. 
The way miracles have, that was 1983. That was the year I finished secondary school. The way the grace of God is upon you and all that. And um, we see the we heard about the miracles and deliverance and prophetic ministration. He now said this. He said, I want you, now that you finish secondary school, go to such and such place and open a church. Start a branch of the church there. I looked at him. I was I can't say no. I said, okay, sir, I will do that. I took my own personal transport money. Never collected transport money from him. Never. Did not even collect money. I took my own transport and transport to that city. And I stayed in that city. And I planted the church. Did not look for money for microphone. Never looked for any place. I approached this, this, a school there and they gave me a place where to start the church. And I was doing the church there until I was pastoring that group until I had an admission. I have to go back and say, look, I, I've got admission. Look at the admission. I want to travel. Send a pastor. Then I sent a pastor to take over the, 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 the church. And I travel. Years back, maybe about two years later, when I came back to that place, the pastor that was there told me, Ernest, he said, look, when you were here, things were happening here. We knew and we heard about it. What is the secret? And I asked, I had to say, for two years, you've been ministering in this place. Instead of things happening, things were going down, things were falling down. I look at him and say, if I were you, I would resign and go and look for business. I told him, if I were you, I would resign and go and look for business and look for a job. Because I discovered that within this two years out, everything was all zero again. Everything went down again. Now, what am I bringing out? If you can't contact the anointing, if you can't contact the anointing, you are wasting your time. The best thing in life is to see God until you, are, you receive the anointing from heaven. Hallelujah. Say, I will receive it. Say, I will receive it. That is the basic and the most important thing is the anointing. Get the anointing, get the fire, and get that grace. And you will never remain the same again. By, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Master your spirit. Master your emotion. Suppress your anger and temper. Suppress it. Don't let your anger control you. Self-control is very important. Look at someone and say self-control. Self-control. Control your anger. Control your spirit. Control your emotion. Control your temper. Keep your mouth shut. Now, for your information, many Christians are dry today because of their mouth. Many Christians. Many Christians. Many Christians are dry because of them. I'm not talking about confession, positive confession or whatever. I'm talking about the kind of people they spoke against. The kind of murmuring. The kind of evil speaking. How they spoke against a pastor. How they spoke against a man of God. Listen to me. Even if they told you such, such man of God did something that is bad, it shouldn't come out from your mouth. If it came out from your mouth at all, you've caused trouble for yourself. Let it come into your ear and let it go out. Don't carry the news to anybody. Don't even discuss it with your wife. Don't even discuss it with anybody. Because if you murmur against a man of God, or you speak evil against a man of God, you are done. You are done. Trouble has started. And I usually tell this thing. I say, look, the best way, the best way to conquer Anything that happened between you and a man of God is to go to that man of God and give him money and bless him. If for any reason something is going wrong, you can't overcome it. Some evil thought or bad thought is coming to your mind concerning the pastor. Go to him and say, man of God, take this. I come to bless you with this. Pray for me. Just keep blessing. Just keep blessing. Just keep. Show your love to him. Until that evil thought that is coming to your mind Concerning that man of God is removed. 
If not, if you keep not that, if you keep nursing that evil thing in your mind concerning a man of God, you are gone. There are people today, they use their house, they use their altar, they use everything around them to speak against a prophet. Please, I beg you. I beg you. I beg you. Whether you are a pastor, whether you are a child or a Christian, a woman or a man or a businessman, if you know anything about a man of God and you use your mouth to report it and begin to say it, you are gone. Please take note. You are gone. It's very dangerous. I will never give my people to anybody who will stand on this altar to criticize any man of God. Never. Never. And if I give you a microphone, you are criticizing a man of God, I will collect the microphone from your hand immediately. And I will tell you, that is not the word. That is not what we come here to preach. Because if you keep listening to it and keep hearing it, you're finished. And I, if I were you, if I go to church and they are, they, the man of God is preaching and is criticizing other men of God on the stage, carry your Bible and walk out. If you don't walk out, you will, get, you will hear things that will bring problems to your life. And that is serious. Whether, don't talk about it to your children. Don't talk about it. On, don't listen to. There's a man. Of, there's a man of God who came here one day, and he knelt and I was begging me, please, I should forgive him. I said, forgive you for what? I did not know you. Oh, he said, I'm from this place. He said, what happened? He said, I used to watch you on television, and because I've heard some few bad things about you, I don't like you. So I make a law in my house. Nobody must watch NS or Dogba. Not on television for any reason. And he's a man of God. Because to him, he has heard some bad stuff about me. That was so bad to him and he's not ready to listen to, to anything. So, most of the time, he could be sleeping or he, he goes out. His wife is my fan the children they are my fan they secretly watch me on television he said because of me him being a pastor slapped and beat the wife because his wife was secretly watching me on television and beat her out of him and teach her the lesson of her life how can you be involved with this kind of man of god called man of god for that reason and nothing happened for one year. He said he preaches, he tells people about how bad I was and all that because of what he heard. And yet he has never seen me. I've never touched him one on one. I've never discussed with him. I don't even know him. And he, he has not seen me one on one. So he said one day, after one year of lambashing me and fighting his family and all that, he was in his house. Angel came to visit him. He said, you are done. You are done. Everything around you is gone. Except you go back to that Enesoroba and let him pray for you if not you are a dead man. He came crying to my office, nailed down, and repenting with tears. I said, oh, I did not even hear all that you have said about me. But in any case, I forgive you, but how all those you have been spoiling my name to, how will you withdraw my name back from, from them? As I forgive you, he left. As I'm telling you right now, he's out of Kaduna. His ministry closed and he packed out. And that one again, took, wrote and published on newspaper, national newspaper, not local, wrote my name and black scarred me. Blast part, uh, uh, me, TB Joshua, and uh, uh, Chris Oyakulime, and also made some few comments with, uh, I think, one man of God in, in Karnatu. I think, in Kayusu, yes. And put it on the national, put my name, and wrote a lot of things about me. Put right on the national newspaper. They said, as you read it, I said, what am I, what? They, I just saw it, see the caption, and I said, they are happy to announce me. They are happy to do what? Then one day, 
because he put my name and wrote a lot of things about him, I was the major attack because he was equating me to as bad as this one, as bad as the other one. They see this one, remember the issue, he turned to this one. Then make reference, he turned this one, turned to snake. This one, he made reference to them. See, I'm as bad and worse than them. That was how he, pro he crucified. Then after some time, he went to Tony and was looking for money to transport to somewhere. So in Tony, say, because Tony also read the newspaper. He said, ah, you wrote against my friend. You were able to publish it on a national newspaper against NS. And you mentioned some other names. The money for transport, you are saying, come and leave my office. I will not give you anything. The guy, the guy, the guy could not succeed in ministry. His church has closed and he's left, has left Cardinal. Now, I don't, it's not my duty. It's not my duty. It's not my duty to look for who and who is speaking against me. Please listen to me. If you speak against men of God, you are in trouble. And if you are a pastor, your duty is to love your other pastors. Love them. If you are a man of God, love pastors. Please listen to me. If you are not a pastor, love men of God. Honor them. It is not your duty to criticize them. I have never used this in my office. As a, people talk against some men of God in Lagos. Maybe T.P. Joshua or whatever, whatever. I have never for one day used my mouth to say anything negative about him. Never. And I will never. Till Jesus come. And I will never. And paraversion, you don't know my faith on that. To me, he is a man of God. That is all I know. Everyone can kick against him. I'm not kicking against him. I don't want to carry a problem that I don't know. What concerns me? I'm doing my work. Everybody should do his work. Nobody is disturbing me. I shouldn't disturb anybody. Hallelujah. I will only talk until I see it in my eyes. I say, eh, now true. I don't see him. Then I feel talk. When I do not see him, I will talk because I hear, they, they say, God forbid. I will not be a particular man that sins. God forbid. God forbid. God forbid. Miriam, Aaron could not fulfill their ministry because of mouth. Even what they were saying was correct. Moses actually married somebody who is not an Israelite. It was a right thing. But, but they, they, they could not fulfill their ministry for saying... I speak for the weak. I'm an advocate for the young. I'm more than a conqueror. I'm a child of covenant. It's my time to laugh. Cause I have conquered it all. Impossible is nothing. Impossible is nothing. I am a champion. I am a mighty one.